Well, for our next guest, um, she is a London-based artist and researcher. She, in her practice, she works with artificial intelligence and she teaches computers to make drawings independently, something called deep learning. She works with real photo photographs of nature, but also with artificial paintings. The results are explorations of the seamless bond between the natural and the artificial, the real and the digital. Please welcome Anna Riedler. I just am going to press play because hopefully I should be able to get my presenter notes on screen. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I feel like I've kind of snuck in to this conversation because I wouldn't say that this particular project that I'm going to talk about is necessarily about landscape, although it is very much, I feel, about nature. I'm going to talk about a project that I've got called uh, Mosaic Virus, which is on in at the Sea Mine Screen at uh, Festival, and talk a little bit about how I came to make it and s why I think using some of these new technologies around machine learning is important to start considering and how it links back to some earlier conversations that were going on in the 18th century around botany. Fantastic. Now I can see what I'm saying. Uh, it's, they always say that people will solve artificial a AI before they solve AV. Um, so, where I, as, as Roland mentioned, I work, a I work very heavily with artificial intelligence or machine learning. And when you work, and everyone kind of is this big buzzword, everyone kind of is talking about it. And as a practitioner, I feel there are two main materials that I use when I'm using, when I'm working with AI. There is the data and training set, which I'm going to talk a lot about, and also the algorithm that is run to create the model that generates images. Um, the algorithms that I use and that I'm particularly interested in are something called GANs, or Generative Adversarial Network. And a GAN is a form of unsupervised machine learning invented in 2014, so ancient in the world of machine learning, that is considered by the scientific community to be notoriously unstable and actually not that well understood. It's this complex iterative process with many interdependencies, and it's kind of this process of two intelligences dancing around each other to make images and and the results of these unpredictable and unquantifiable results of the two dynamics working together. For a GAN to be constructed, one artificial intelligence network is trained on a series of images known as the training set, which it then uses to try and create re a realistic version of an image that could potentially come from that training set. The second network looks at these created images and decides whether or not they are real or fake, true or counterfeit. As the second network is good at judging images that could not pass, the first network learns to mimic imagery to the extent that counterfeits are indistinguishable from genuine articles over the courses of many cycles of learning or epochs. And this is commonly known in the community and even in scientific articles as dreaming or hallucinating, which I think is a really lovely way of describing these very digital images. What do, so what do these kind of images produce? This should be fine, yes. This is a video where all of the images that are being shown are not just parts of photographs that have been stitched together, but pictures that have been entirely dreamt or hallucinated of what an AI thinks that it should be producing for each category, each natural category in question, using a GAN. This is from a science experiment but to me, these images are incredibly beautiful. They have this meandering dreamlike quality to the results, the results that are recognizable as being real if you glance at them quickly, but at the same time have tells if you really examine them to show that they are not. And these imperfections, these traces of process, these are the quality that I love about working with this as a material that I want to take and that I want to question and work with. But I also feel there is a finite amount of time when these kind of this weirdness will exist in these models. 
The technology industry wants realism, and advancements in computer vision try and minimise what these kind of these mistakes, for want of a better word. So you start, you're starting to see more and more imagery that are deep, what are called deep fakes, these very photorealistic images. And I feel that this is this is maybe an area where it's it's problematic because as a creative person. I really like these kind of this weirdness and these mistakes. And I think it's also really important because when you see these imperfection, it really draws attention to the process of how machine learning works, how, th how these images are constructed, and perhaps also what is what wrong with this process. As soon as something becomes too smooth, it stops being noticeable and people stop questioning or challenging it. So, and one of, the, one of the ways where AI needs to be questioned and challenged is the makeup of the data or training set, so the imagery that goes into the algorithm in order for it to produce images. They are central to this whole process of creating a model, creating an artificial intelligence. And they're really not that... I think there's a movement now to start to critically engage with them, but for a long time they were the, the, the area of computer scientists and the creative community was not pushing back on them. So the data sets that are needed to make machine learning models are often extremely large, thousands and thousands, sometimes millions of images and inputs, and very often proprietary. Whereas you can go online and get code to create a model very, very easily, it's much more difficult to find the imagery and the inputs that you then need to run it. A small number of data sets, such as ImageNet, which is on the screen now, are open source, and these form the backbone of machine learning projects in science and arts. And although they're readily available, they're, compi they're still compiled by researchers using mechanical Turks. Um, and there's something really interesting about the invisible labor and association, associated power relationships there, using a variety of different methodologies. But because people are always involved in, at some point, either in the source content, so what type of imagery do you choose to put into these data sets, or in the process, how are those images labeled? They inevitably come to enshrine cultural or social attitudes, otherwise known as data set bias. And for me, this is a really important point because people often talk about machine learning as being this purely digital thing. But for me, it is a very, very human endeavor. It's this way of trying to map the world, trying to kind of create a dictionary, create an encyclopedia of the world that exists around us and then feed it to a machine. So machine, and it's one of the real things that I find so interesting about it as a tool, as a process, is that it's not this kind of purely digital thing, but it's a very, very human way of looking at the world. For example, I know this has nothing to do with landscapes, but I will get there. ImageNet, as I spoke, as I mentioned, is a canonic this very, very canonical database. It's used for almost every single as a benchmark for so many different computer vision algorithms. So if you're using something that has computer vision in it, it probably at some point would have been tested against ImageNet. And if you look at how it categorizes as women, and I use this example a lot because it's just so appalling, um, it has this very narrow, very conventional idea of what a woman is. So if you look at all the sub kind of, I don't know if you can read it, but if you look at all of the subcategories that a woman can be, it's either super sexualized or an old lady. Um, and then if you look at the associated imagery, it's hypersexualized. And these images, this is, are called, they're known as images in the wild. So these are images where they're kind of just taken off the internet. They're not kind of studio, they're not kind of professionally done. Um, and this kind of labeling and this kind of categorization comes up a lot in machine learning because if you have 14 million images, unless you're looking at every single one, it's very unlikely that you'll start to see how, how this world has been constructed it's virtually impossible to look through. So the amount of control that you have as an artist when you're using these off-the-shelf data sets, which are really kind of one of the few things that are available unless you work at Google or Facebook, the amount of control that you have, the amount of, that you can kind of understand what's been included and what's been ex 
excluded, what kind of biases and prejudices are being replicated and repeated is very difficult to control. And this is something that I am incredibly interested in, the power that you have in how you construct your data set when you're working with this as a material. And how I've kind of like tried to use this in my work is something that I've been pushing uh, for a lot of the time. So self-generated data for me is incredibly important, either by making it all myself, so taking lots and lots of photographs, making lots and lots of drawings, or by constructing it from an existing data source, but looking at every single piece of information that I have. And it becomes, in a way, a decisive creative act. It is something that is within my control, even before I touch a line of code. And there is an art to it. The thi I really love this, that in, um, up until relatively recently, under British copyright law, a database was considered to be a literary work as an acknowledgement of the amount of skill and effort that goes into creating them. So that's all very nice. But how do I use this in my own work? Playing is a snippet of a piece that is on, as I mentioned, at ScreenNet, which and it's showing in a much nicer way. It always looks a bit shoddy when it's on PowerPoint. And I've tried to use machine learning very much as a process and a tool not just to explore the ethical implications of the technology, but to use it to push my work and explore ideas in a way that I wouldn't be able to do otherwise. This piece, Mosaic Virus, draws on historical parallels between tulip mania that swept across the Netherlands in the 1630s to the speculation that is ongoing around cryptocurrencies. We've already heard a little bit from Vlad around the commodification of nature, and I feel that there's so much here around kind of how people have tried to take nature and parcel it out and put a value on it. The, in this piece, each still is generated by an AI, showing a tulip blooming, an updated version of the Dutch still life of the 21st century. But the appearance of the tulip is controlled by the price of Bitcoin. And in this piece, I wanted to draw together ideas around capitalism, around value, and the tangible and intangible nature of speculation and collapse from these two very different yet surprisingly similar moments in time. And I'm not the first person to make the connection between tulip mania and Bitcoin. It was being done by the Dutch Central Bank back in 2013. Um, and I wanted to kind of like use it not merely as a tool, but as another way of understanding the subject matter, as I said. Um, the demand for kind of tulips at the height of tulip mania was driven in part by the desire for stripy tulips. Stripy tulips were caused by a virus known as the mosaic virus that gave kind of um, the blooms their distinctive stripes. Nobody knew at the time how this virus worked. So you could have a white tulip one year and then the next year it could be stripy. And because nobody really understood how it worked, it helped drive the speculative buying and selling of the bulbs, which legend had it could be sold for the same price as a townhouse. They worked out in the 1920s that the stripes were caused by um, bugs laying their eggs into the bulb, which is also quite nice because it's one of the only instances of plants a plant disease hugely increasing the value of the infected plant. But they didn't know how this worked at the time. They would do things like take a white tulip bulb and a red tulip bulb and cut them in half and try and glue them together in the hope that it would work. They would paint stripes in the ground. They would import Dutch soil to England and all of these things. And this kind of gave these tulips this special aura surrounding it with mystique and the language of alchemy. And growers deliberately wanted it to seem strange, difficult, and unobtainable because that increased its value. And this lack of understanding around the thing that's generating wealth reminded me so much of the rush towards blockchain and cryptocurrencies when it started. The Long Island Iced Tea Corporation makes soft drinks, but they changed their name to the Long Island Blockchain Corporation and company shares soared as much as 500% in pre-market trading. So you've already got the similarity of this rush towards wealth without this understanding of it, um, which to me it get, makes that connection just much stronger than how these objects behave on a line on a graph. 
And the other thing that one of the reasons why I wanted to use this particular technology to explore it is that AI is in itself in the middle of its own hype and speculative bubble. Every time you read the newspaper, every time you look at the news, you see kind of artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning, AI, everywhere. They're the buzzwords of the moment. And so I wanted to use the machine learning, the way that I'm using it as a material is reflecting the message of the piece. And there's also a tradition of tulips in art history, as I'm sure you probably all know far more about it than I do. Um, in the 1630s, they featured prominently at the time the so-called vanitas paintings that illustrated that beauty and treasure are only fleeting, which makes it um, particularly nice for a piece that is talking about the stock market. But again, thinking about how these technologies work, Again, as I said, is not constructing an image by taking fragments of what... It's not constructing an image by repeating something that it's already seen. It's constructing an image by taking fragments and creating new things that it could potentially be, botanical impossibilities. And for me, this sits really nicely in this, this lineage of Dutch painting, because in these bouquets, they are also botanical impossibilities, because they feature flowers that bloom in winter and spring and summer and autumn. They couldn't all exist at once. So again, it's thinking about how this material can then kind of work with these traditions and bring them kind of bring them along rather than kind of and placing it within this 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 lineage. And to make this piece, because of like all of the issues around data set bias that I'm hyper aware of, and because I wanted to reference this very kind of Dutch still life aesthetic, I needed to make my own data set. I couldn't just Google um, tulips, back background, labeled stripiness. I had to make my own. So I took 10,000 photographs of tulips, and I was working in the Netherlands, so luckily it was not too expensive. Um, and the reason why I stopped at 10,000 wasn't because it's a nice round number, although it is. I stopped at 10,000 because tulip season ended. I went to the market one day and there were just peonies. So even though this is an incredibly digital piece, it's very much driven by the rhythms of nature. And when you kind of create this type of data set, it forces you to examine each image and inverts the usual process of machine learning, which is seen to be rapid, quick. Um, there's a huge difference when you do this labor yourself. Um, you notice, you notice variations, you notice how there's no perfect ideal one. The differences of what you're, what you're searching for, because that's what will produce interesting results. And it's really interesting that Pradisha just talked about craft because I feel that like when you're working with this, there is very much a craft and an art. And I feel that this data set creation is like craft. And it also kind of, if you look historically how it's been portrayed in kind of like the scientific community, the data set is seen as the craft and the algorithm is seen as the art. The data set is repetitive, it's time consuming, it's anonymous, um, it's often outsourced. And the algorithm is authored, it's <laughs> valuable, it's given a different place in the kind of the pecking order of things. But just like craft, building these data sets has a skill. If, it if you build a data set that is too big, if there are too many images, the results will be too good almost, and the quirks and oddities that make this an interesting medium to explore will disappear. But if you make it too small and don't ha put in enough information, that algorithm won't be able to work and it will pr either produce nothing, it will produce noise, or it will only produce one or two variations from the training set again and again and again. And then the other thing that I had to do for this was to categorize every single photograph by hand. And it was at this point that I decided to make this act of making a data set into a separate artwork and display it as, stu as such. So when I had to categorize it, I had to kind of put down what color it was, what type of tulip, how striped it was, whether it was a bud or dying. And this is an insane amount of work. And it's work that is usually hidden. And by making it a separate piece displayed in relation to the video work, I drew attention to this act of categorization and also the human element by handwriting each of the labels. 
one of the things that I'm really interested in is bringing the human out of the technological because there's, I feel, sometimes a shiny robotic quality to a lot of kind of like how we perceive the digital, which for me appears to neuter the messiness of the world. And I'm really interested in how you can do the opposite, how you can use a medium that is algorithmic and maybe a bit cold or sterile to maintain and accentuate the sense of the human behind it. And you can start to have discussions about the fact that AI doesn't magically spring from the ground, how that there is always a human decision somewhere along the chain, and how this is absolutely not a correct thing. Even something as simple as a single type of tulip is difficult to put into discrete categories. Is it white? Is it pale pink? Is it orange? Is it yellow? And if it's difficult to do this for a single type of flower, it's much more, imagine how difficult it is for these systems to understand something like gender or identity. And in particular, this, this, I found it so hard to categorize by color. And this was something that is not new. Carl Linnaeus, who was the first person to kind of like introduce taxonomies, opposed kind of recording color as a necessary or desired trait in describing plants because he felt that paying attention to these outward characteristics would lead botanists into the state of confusing synonyms that like this system of categorization seeks to eradicate and how when you start to do this work yourself and bring it into your practice you find that definition perception sensations and separations of color are intimately tied to a labored process from start to finish and even the most scientific ob observation presents this tenuous triangulation between sensation, material form, and translating it. And then, so the other thing about this data set um, is that the entire installation is 100 square meters. It's only been displayed once by a very brave gallery in Germany. And it's very easy to forget in a digital age that information is physical and that the things that you see on a screen once started out in the real world. And by placing things back into the real world, people can start to comprehend aspects of the data that they didn't before. You have a very different experience if you kind of have a thumb drive and you scroll through 10,000 photographs than if you have a room twice the size of this where every single surface is covered in tiny photographs. You have a very different reaction to the labor, to the value, to the time that gets spent putting it together. But despite all of this categorization, it's a mistake that I think to think that I have control over what I produce. It's impossible to predict what comes out in each of the stills. I can guess, but I can never know. And to, the, to me, this is really exciting. It becomes this weird, eerie experience of making. It's like I've constructed a DNA for my tulips by making my data set, but I don't know what type of thing it will produce. What's showing is if you look closely, you can kind of see how it is not a real tulip. It's not doing a time lapse. But by using technology in this context, by acknowledging its falseness and using AI to kind of decay and change and move things, it fits in this within this history of vanitas pr painting, provoking questions, if not of mortality, then at least perhaps around transience. And just to kind of conclude, I think there's been a lot of talk around where machine learning and AI sits within a kind of artistic, in the artistic spread in art history. And most people put it in the lineage of algorithmic or generative art. But for me, I don't think that that makes sense in, within my own practice. And I think it can kind of can, uh, flatten down some of the problems and potentials for it. I actually find it much more helpful to think of it in the context of land or environmental art. When I work, I set up all of the variables when I make the work, so the data set, the categorization, the photographing, the drawing, the whatever, and then I allow something with outside of my control to act on it in a way, so it's similar to kind of how these land artists would kind of set something up and then allow elements, plants, water to work on it. And it's also this moment of where does the art sit? Because I think for a lot of land and environmental art, 
what you actually experience in the gallery is documentation of that process. And I feel that's also what happens with a lot of machine learning art. You're not actually witnessing the work itself. That's somewhere buried deep inside a computer. What you're seeing is documentation of that process. And this kind of, this way of working, this way of allowing something that is outside of your control that you can predict but you can't ever fully know is both of these kind of linked together for me and make it an incredibly exciting thing to start working with. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? I see a hand in the back. Can we pass the mic? Um, where is all the data stored if you need so many pictures? So I store it on very large hard drives, but I'm, I'm working at the very minimum that you need. So I'm working around 10,000 images, which is about the minimum that you need to produce something good. Um, if you're, it's actually, very, like, it's actually very difficult to kind of like keep all of the data together. And um, so sometimes when I'm working on larger projects, it's just kind of like, yeah, it's on multiple hard drives, all plugged in, in a very okay. hacky way. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any more questions? No? Oh, over here. There's another question. Just a second. I'll just do it out loud. Ah, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> if you would do this exercise that you did with mm -hmm. Philips again, which I guess will be one of the new inspirations, what is something you would try to get another form of taxonomy over it as a data set? What is would be triggering you to do, uh, to do something similar? I'm I'm not sure I have another iteration of the tulips in me, um, <laughs> but I think I think it's like one of the things that I might do is the the angle that it's at because one of the things I think that might be interesting in the future is being able to produce something in 3D, um, which I don't have that information. I, d I mean I have it because I took it from all angles, but I don't have it kind of listed, and the thought of going back through all of the photographs and relabeling <laughs> them drives me to despair but I think that's like one of the things that is like very important when you're working with this is that you are making all of these choices you're deciding what is important for you to kind of label and what's important what you are ignoring and so that's why they kind of become this almost like a, a it's a very personal personal thing so I get asked so much um, by scientists to open source this data set <laughs> and they always look appalled when I'm like no it's an artwork you can buy it as an artwork um, but because for me it's a very personal way of rendering my world lots of different artists work with kind of like I think there are three different ways that you can work with data sets you can scrape it off the internet you can use these canonical existing ones or you can build it the, from the ground up and that for me is really exciting because I'm creating my own truth I'm creating my own world and then trying to like give it to a machine and, and create that world in, inside it Thank you. Any more questions? I have one question for you, sure. Anna. Um, where, because there's very different steps in your progress, mm -hmm. in, your, uh, in your methodology, is there a way to somewhere draw a line between the real and the artificial? I think it's, it's difficult because I think there are, there's the real tulip, then there's the photograph of the real tulip, then there's the AI-generated version of the tulip. And e all of them are equally real, and well, except for the real tulip, that's always going to be real. Mm. But the photograph is also, in a way, a copy, and the AI-generated version is a copy. Mm -hmm. And so you get to this kind of almost Borges-like state of copies of copies of copies. And I think you know what is on screen and what's sh being shown in scene mine is a real piece of art it's not a fake piece of art um but there is this tension i think between kind of creating 
this kind of like using all of these natural resources, both in terms of kind of cutting these ten th like these thousands and thousands of tulips and using all of this kind of energy, because machine learning is also like incredibly energy intensive, to create these perfect simulacras of the natural world that is difficult and problematic. But yeah, I don't I don't really have a neat answer for you. It's a difficult question <laughs> that way. Thank you so much, Anna Hitler. Thank you. Read the yes. Robert. Tell me about your drawings. Uh, yeah, this is one of the stupid. It was a stupid joke about drawing the line. Uh, just to try to uh, the, the data set madness. Uh, this is what I imagine your <laughs> computer looks like uh, with the tulips. Uh, yeah, tulips conversing. Um, the 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 tulips. What would be the data set? What would be the algorithm? The I imagine the bowl would be the the data the data set. I don't know. Uh, Philosophical question. Uh, the blockchain, I have no idea what it is, so yeah. Lol, <laughs> uh, lol, lol, whatever. Uh, yeah, the tulip, uh, money, tulip, uh, images in the wild, sorry. Haha, <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. Uh, the glasses for machine learning, uh, everybody needs to get one. Bidding starts at uh, 1,000 euros. And uh, there was something very nice you said about the machine learning, dancing around each other. Uh, I really like the poetic uh, 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 feel of it. Here you go. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rita.